Oh, ho, 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 baby. Thursday edition here. What is up, everybody? And welcome in. Wait. All alone out here. The DMVR Nuggets podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top rated sportsbook app. Use promo code DMVR whenever you sign up. Solo at the moment. We'll be joined by Kirk Henderson, my good buddy, here in just a little bit, about 10 to 15 minutes in. He'll be joining us for the rest of the show. A majority of today's show is going to be on the matchup between the Nuggets and the Mavs over the weekend, Friday and Sunday. Going to be a doubleheader, both in Dallas. Going to preview that one, maybe complain a little bit about the schedule makers, go over some details, and then even talk more broadly about building around Luka, building around Nikola. I think there are some very interesting lessons that you can kind of compare and contrast the two ways both teams have attempted and also look at some historical references over the last decade about, um, you know, uh, about what teams have done that have had great players, the LeBron, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, James Harden, what things have worked, what things didn't. And is there a lesson in there that's maybe a bit surprising the further we get into obviously Jokic's tenure in Denver? But Lucas' tenure in Dallas, I think there are some interesting things. Kirk will be on to join me to uh, – he actually – I haven't even prepped him for those things, but he's always got good perspective on that, so I look forward to doing that. We'll also have some fun, bounce around the NBA a little bit. Some, uh, it, it just It's Thursday. We're almost into the weekend. Been a long week for me personally, and I think I know for a lot of the guys here. So I want to have a little bit of fun today. There's some funny stuff that has happened on the internet, and I just kind of want to bounce around uh, with Kirk and, and, and go over some of that. But first, you'll notice I'm all alone today. Uh, a couple things, you know, Brendan Vote had, uh, uh, you know, he's going to be off for the weekend. He had something he had to get to. You had Harrison Wind, who's taking a vacation. He's had kind of scheduled out a little bit. So those guys gone. And then uh, D-Line has been pulling all-nighters really for like an entire week. I don't know if he has slept since last Tuesday. He's been working pretty hard. All of us here at DNVR have to get this diehard launch out. I'm going to talk about that here in a second. But that's why the guys are off today. You know, Dev doesn't usually join us on off days. He's, a, he's, he's usually on game days. So it was one of those things where everything lined up so that everybody was gone at the exact same time. Still want to get a show in for you. Thought it was a great opportunity to bring Kirk in. And we'll get to all of that. And he'll be joining us. He actually just popped backstage. I can see him. Oh, my God. He looks beautiful. You guys can't wait till you see his hair. Um, so <laughs> making him self-conscious now. So um, but first, I wanted to talk a little bit about today was a big day for DMVR. And, you know, 90 percent of what I do in a typical day or, or what most like people like Eric do in a typical day at DMVR is not seen. It never it's not stuff that makes it, you know, directly to you where you see what's going on. This was something that has been in the works for about, I mean, I say a month. It's been in the works for two years. Um, you know, us talking, uh, uh, somebody says, you're not alone, Adam. We're here with you. Us talking about trying to figure out the right model for DNVR. What is it that's going to work? And obviously, it's not just DNVR anymore. It's all city. It's expanded into new markets with more and more markets coming on board. Today, we launched the Die Hard line, the Die Hard subscription. So originally, we said, okay, we're a subscription service. This was back in the old BSN days, a subscription service, kind of like The Athletic, to be honest with you. When BSN started, it was very similar to the concept that The Athletic was putting out. Beat reporters, writing news stories, and then putting them behind a paywall. You pay for it, you get access to that. To various levels of success. Then you get to DNVR and you start to add things in like merch and watch parties. And, you know, we, we have the podcast and we start adding all of these different layers to it. And the one thing we've noticed, you know, is that the there's a diehard level of people that consume everything we do. The list, wind chimes, you know, just talking about the, the, the basketball stuff. But over time, you kind of notice that that group of people, maybe it, it gets cut off a little bit from Okay, your people that are really in, those people are in, but you're not seeing the writing. You're not seeing the written stuff. I do the list all the time, and people I, people are always surprised when I tell them it's one of the least consumed pieces of content we have at DNVR is the list, and a lot of people say it's their favorite. So you try to figure out how could something be people's favorite and also the least popular? How do you square those two things? And you know, you look at places like The Athletic um, who offer for the last like three years – they're really kept afloat by hedge funds and, and by investment and different things. And they have some great writers over there. They can't sell subscriptions either. They've been working on I mean, this been their number one, two, and three thing. And they've been struggling to get subscriptions out there. They started selling them for $1 for an entire year, $1. And it really was, I mean, we know this is a startup ourselves as this ploy to say, will people pay for written content? Then you got places like Substack that come in where you pay for one writer. And I think that's actually been very successful in a weird way 
it's funny what people's reading habits are in a weird way. If you have one writer you like, you might be more inclined to pay for that one writer than if it's a part of a whole package. This is what we're seeing with some of the very successful sub stacks out there is it's like, well, I really like this guy. I'm willing to pay five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever it is just to get access. This guy writes for a site over here. For some reason, there's this weird disconnect there. So we've experimented with this like everyone else has. And I think we have a great model. We've obviously been successful for three years, opening up a whole bunch of different things. You know, we make our money. People always wonder, like, where does the money in, in DNVR come from? You know, it comes from everything we do. It comes from our advertising partners. It comes from our podcasts, which are, uh, you know, Broncos, Avs, Nuggets, the biggest in all of Denver, uh, you know, Buffs, Rams, the biggest in all of the world. You know, um, we, we crush it in those spaces and we do a good job there. We have advertising. We sell merchandise. You know, when you guys buy a shirt from us, it's one of the best ways to support us. If you like something that we're doing, you know, down at the bar, we have ways to monetize. We, we have all these different revenue streams. You look at all the different ones and say what works and we're always trying to make them better. And we looked at this and we thought, we still want memberships. We still think our written stuff is worth a, a, a subscription. But how do we appease both the people that are willing to pay for content and the people that maybe haven't paid for content traditionally? How do we get them things that they're at least seeing that we're doing this written content and maybe lure them in? And this was the adjustment we made. So we made more things free than ever before. Before we had about 10% of our content was free, 90% of it behind the paywall. We're flipping that. We're making it roughly 80%, 85% is now free to everybody. And this includes the list. This includes, um, you know, this includes uh, wind chimes, what makes this play great, all of that kind of stuff. We're going to be making more and more of those free. I mean, I think when we talk about the list, half of them, roughly half of them are going to be free. And in doing so, my belief is that there's going to be even a bigger motivation to move because I love writing. And I know that where do we make money at this company? It's not from my writing. I love doing it. People love consuming it. But I have to put my time in as one of the owners of this company, one of the partners, I have to put my time, invest my time into things that are going to keep this company afloat. So now my hope is that people really like the, the film studies and the different things. This will have bigger incentive to reach wider audiences there. And then hopefully it's a thing where if before you just ignored the list, now it's a thing that you're getting at least half of them, if not a little bit more. And now you're more inclined to subscribe. So you get 100% of those things. So we're going to try it out. It's a new thing we really believe in. And we wanted to provide more value to everyone everybody but then you have members who are already members we want we don't want to take something away from them without giving them something else in addition and so you saw the thing that went out today members are now called diehards diehards get access to all of our content there's nothing that's locked for you if you're a member of DNVR if you're a DNVR diehard but in addition we've also made more discounts for all of the other types of things that we do every year when you sign when you sign up it used to be you got a, a t-shirt when you sign up. Now you get one every single year on your renew date. Every single year you get a free t-shirt. So uh, you'll get a code that comes in the mail and says, hey, congrats, one year anniversary. Go on in the merch store, pick up a shirt for free and get it to you. We're giving discounts. Everything that's in our locker, the DNVR locker, is now discounted for members. There's two tier pricing. If you're a non-member, it's a certain price. If you're a member, it's going to be 20% off. Then we have exclusive merch and I can't wait. I don't think we've dropped it yet, but Eric you know, has some new stuff, D-Line has some really new stuff to to that's coming out that you can only get if you're a member. So you're going to see it and you're like, man, I really like that hat. I really like that jacket. I really like that hoodie, whatever it is. Only available exclusive merch drops that are just through for, for, uh, for diehards. Obviously discounted every other thing that we do, tailgates, events, the bar, uh, all of that good stuff. And then this podcast is a big part of where a lot of people access us. We're going to start adding new weekly things that'll go up behind the paywall. So you'll still get your five shows in your inbox every single week, you know, post-game shows, pre-game shows and everything else. But then we're going to add a little bit onto there. We do mailbags. We're going to do some extra mailbags that are just behind the paywall to kind of give a little bit better access. Some stuff at Ball Arena, interviews around there. They might be 10, 15 minutes long, but it's just a little bit of extra content that I think you guys will like. That'll give a little bit of extra bonus. And then lastly, I know there's been a lot of talk about Twitter. What's going to happen with it? What's going on? Is it going away? Is it getting worse? We, for the last year, year and a half, have had the DNVR Lounge, a.k.a. the Discord. The Discord is a place for people to go in and talk nuggets. And just now we have a Nuggets chat. We have a Broncos chat. We have a bunch of other things. We even have like a movie chat. But we have a place in there that is, you know, just for Nuggets conversation. And I'll tell you, it rarely rarely ever goes off the rails in there. It's a very cordial place for you to go. 
um, and have conversations with people that want to talk nuggets. It's not a place where everybody necessarily agrees, but it's a place where people don't really fight. We have good conversation in there. Uh, and a lot of people you see in the sidebar in the chat every single day on this show are also in there. And we're going to try to up it even a little bit more by hopping in there on regular scheduled times, do AMAs, just kind of hop in there and maybe share extra video clips that didn't make the list or didn't make this or that and go through them. We'll also be doing some playbacks of games. You guys remember when we did playbacks, we'll do some old games. Like for example, I, it would be, I'm not gonna have time to do this today, but it'd be great to go back and watch the second half of last night's game on playback with people who are DMVR members. So share a link there. Hey, let's rewatch it and I'm gonna pause and, and, and kind of answer questions and point things out as we watch this game so everybody has a chance to see. So I think there's gonna be some really cool, more stuff for everything, for, for the you know non-members and more stuff for members as well that I think you're gonna like. So if you haven't checked it out, our number one goal is that if you have never visited the dnvr.com or if it's been months since you have, we hope that now when you wake up in the morning, it's in the rotation of places that you go. You go check out the dnvr.com and see what's news. Wind have a new article, Adam have a new article, vote have a new article. Go check those things out and kind of make it part of your new routine. So I'm excited about it. We've been working on it a ton uh, behind the scenes and uh, I'm excited for it to be done with. All right, that being said, now we can get into some of today's stuff. Um, I wanna talk, before I bring Kirk on, I wanted to just give Mike, because I was not on the post game show yesterday, I was at the arena and had a chance to go back and rewatch the second half of last night's game. And I just wanted to make two quick notes that were my big takeaway from last night's game. Number one, you know, because Nicole is not playing, you get into some new rotations. And one of the things that I really liked about last night's game that I kind of, that's got me thinking is that bench unit and Malone called it out after the game said it was great. It was the reason Denver built a 10 point lead. In fact, I think they were tied or up one. And then over the course of them being in there, they got it up to 10. I thought Malone rode the lineup a little too long and then it got down to six or something like that. Kind of a classic Malone move. Oh, the bench is rolling. Just leave them out there. And then they get tired. You know, you bring Julius Randle in, you bring, um, uh, you know, you bring some of the starters back in Jalen Brunson and the bench unit starts to give up the lead that they had worked so hard to build. But what I liked about that unit was it was Bones Highland, Bruce Brown and Christian Brown, uh, Zeke Naji and Blacko Chanchar. That's Bones Highland, you know, regular rotation piece. Bruce and Christian Brown who have been in the rotation, but they're like, you know, hustle guys. Zeke and Blacko who have not been in there, but are also hustle guys. Hustle is one of those things when we talk about skill sets, you think about scoring defense. Then you think about shooting, rebounding. You know, you start thinking of it this way. You rarely think about the intangible traits like hustle. And I think the Nuggets, especially in that second unit, the traditional one, not the one I'm mentioning, have had a bit of a lack of that. Just the toughness, the grit, the will you get things done. And when I went back and watched it this time, just trying to think about what went well for that group, I thought Vlaka was great. I think setting hard screens for a play, when you only have one player on the court who's a creator, and in this case, it's Bones Highland, a little bit of Bruce Brown, but mostly it's Bones Highland, hard screens become more important. If you have a Jokic out there and a Murray and all these other things, I don't. I think they're less important. You're trying to get play the angles. I've, I've done videos on this and why Jokic doesn't always just make the like brick wall screens. He usually doesn't. In fact, he's trying to get the defender to go over or under because it triggers a sets of uh, a series of reactions after that or a series of reads. But when you only have one guy, Bones, who's the pot stirrer, and you have a bunch of guys who are just finishers, like Vlaco's not going to create. Zeke's not going to create. Christian Brown's not going to create. When you have guys like that on the court, the hard screen is important because it allows Bones Highland to kind of get going. I thought Vlaco did a very good job of this. Vlaco is one of those guys that always knows where he's supposed to be. One of the things that happened last night was I thought guys didn't, they, you know, they were a three was in a four spot and, and a four had to play five and guys were just out of position. Vlaco is one of those guys that doesn't happen. But more than anything, when you go back and look at what were the big plays, a lot of them came on second chance points, loose balls that got recovered, uh, just making something out of nothing, not because it was a lineup that clicked and everything came into place, but it was just that they kind of had enough guys on the court that wanted it more and made things happen. You're talking about a Knicks team that's on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. Bruce is going to outwork everyone. Christian Brown's going to work really hard and he grabbed some big rebounds. I thought Zeke in the first half got outworked. I thought Zeke in the second half outworked uh, the other guys, I thought Zeke Naji had a great second half, by the way. I thought he had an atrocious first half and I was very worried. I thought he had a great second half. And even Vlaco, you know, he's not a guy that stands out as like diving on the floor, this or that, but he's in the right spots and he's not like just watching. He's never just watching. He's always doing something. And then of course, Bones plays at a million miles per hour. 
So for me, I thought that that was part of what was so important about the game was you kind of got something positive out of those guys. Um, and then I, I, an interesting thing with Zeke, we talk about is he a four, is he a five? Last night, he was a small ball five. I mean, was it him or Zeke? Doesn't really matter. They were playing small enough, and you had Jericho Sims, who was a, he, I, he's so athletic, man. I don't know if it jumped out on the screen, but that guy, he's so tall. He reminds me of like young DeAndre Jordan. He's so tall and he jumps so high that it's crazy to watch. Like him and Zeke, he, they're like the same height. They would jump, and Sims would be like three feet higher than <laughs> Zeke Naji. At least that's what it felt like. He was so springy. But what was neat in the second half was you started having Zeke drawing Sims into conundrums. He would just try to hang back in the in the paint. Zeke would be open, not so much for kickouts, although he did get one kickout, but it was mostly just for like ball reversals and different things where all of a sudden Sim has to run out now. And Denver grabbed offensive rebounds. So Zeke Naji was a five last night, but it was in a circumstance that I thought actually lent itself to working for Denver in that one way. So I thought it was interesting. I thought that was a lesson you can take away. The other guys did a, you know, last night talked about the end of game execution, the starters not scoring a single point in the fourth and all of those things. Those things were important too, but I just wanted to highlight that one thing uh, about what I saw. Um, let me take a quick break, Kirk, and then I'm going to bring you in. Uh, so, and then we can have a little bit of fun. Just wanted to kind of run through these quick notes before we got to anything else. We'll take an early break before getting to the other side. First, want to tell you guys about the Game Time app. If you're looking to purchase uh, tickets to a game, you know where to go. You don't even have to think about a website. You don't have to think about a, a, an app. We'd love, love you to download the app. But all you have to really do is go, you know, let me open up the YouTube page for DNVR or let me pull up uh, the podcast for DNVR Nuggets. Scroll down and click on the link because we always put it in the description there. And if you're a procrastinator like my buddy Kirk, ultimate pro procrastinator, this is the app for you because it actually rewards procrastination. You want to go to a game, you know, you know, you didn't buy tickets a week before, you didn't buy tickets a day before. It doesn't matter. Go down to the arena, get, you know, pay for your parking, walk up, open up the app and see what they have there because the last minute there's always these huge price drops that allow you to get a great deal at the last second uh, on uh, on tickets to Nuggets games. By the way, this last game, there were available tickets, man. It was not a sellout, which I was a little surprised for. It was an eight o'clock tip. It was a weeknight. It was freezing cold here in Denver. But nonetheless, that would have been a great night to hop on game time because you probably could have got like $5 tickets, which is awesome. If you love DNVR, then you're going to love game time. The best way to support us is buying tickets, uh, your tickets through the link in the description here. And by the way, just a little secret, use our link, the one in the nugget shows. A little difference there for us. Join over 15 million people who have downloaded the game time app and score the best seats to your favorite events. Also want to tell you about the presenting sponsor of this show, DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook. NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball's back. Tip off the season with DraftKings Sportsbook, an, especial, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 bet on the money line and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. They've also got those same stepped up, same game parlays. I've been using these every day of the NBA season. Whenever we do our, I shouldn't say every day, every Nuggets day of the NBA season, they always have the thing on there. It's like opt in, make a single game parlay, and then they give you that odds boost. Um, those are still active in a lot of ways. Uh, Single game parlays to me are like the least smart way to bet, but the most fun way to bet. So it's like if you're, I always say you shouldn't gamble unless you're a professional gambler. Gambling to make money, that's one thing. Gambling to have a good time and just have a little extra thing to put, uh, to kind of keep your eye on, that's the way to go and bet a limit that you like. Parlays are absolutely the best way to do that. I always bet on Michael Porter threes. Usually pays out, didn't pay out this last time. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use promo code DNVR. Make any $5 bet this week and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code DNVR. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, let's go ahead and bring in Kirk Henderson from Mavs Moneyball. You guys know him as the Iceman, uh, and he is here with us. You'll never live it down, Kirk. We'll bring it up every time you come on the show. It's good to it's good to be known for something. <laughs> you know. Sarcastic comments, um, perpetual cynicism. Uh, and, well, I, uh, I wanna yeah. first I need to address how you, you talked about how you like to gamble. Um yeah. I, I need the crowd to know that how Adam gambles. <laughs> If you've ever gambled yeah. with Adam, this is this is private <laughs> conversation, but I'm I'm for it. Let's hear it. Let's hear well, let's it. Let's just let you know that, that Adam gambles the way he pro he plays pickup basketball, very enthusiastically, competitively. He lets you know where you stand, even if you <laughs> might be wrong. Um, I've uh, anyway. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me. I, I'm good. I'm known around these parts as a bully. I don't know if I I, I think it's unfair. Would you describe like bully me gambling? A... Is that what you do? That's what that's the point. <laughs> 
<laughs> Bully I feel ball. like I bring the I bring the vibes gambling. Whenever we go, so Kirk is you know one of my good buddies, obviously in this world, and every we go to summer league every year. My first time to summer league met Kirk, and ever since then, every summer league we're always going together, and it's a tradition. We go out gambling together. We play a little blackjack, and uh, we let loose a little bit. And uh, I feel. I can't believe you're giving me. You're making it sound like I suck the energy out of the room. I feel like I inject the room with energy. You do. I'm just a terrible gambler, and I like to blame you. <laughs> I'm fine with that, man. I'm fine with being blamed for it. It is fun. There is nothing more fun than at the blackjack table, like blaming someone for just like picking a card, and then you lose, and you're like, it's your fault. That's right. It's the most fun. Um I want to go before we get into the, some of this stuff because I knew I had to give that long winded thing at the beginning. I kind of wanted to talk about some other stuff and have fun before we get into the Mavs Nugget stuff. Sure. If that's all right with you, the number one thing every organization is run differently. I mean, we could talk about the ways Denver and Dallas are run differently. The Knicks are hilarious because last night the Knicks are in town and I'm talking to some of my buddies. I got some buddies like in you know front office roles and I got some buddies that are like media members and I'm talking to some people about. Leon Rose and the Knicks. And I was blown away that there are media members, prominent media members, not like, you know, oh, I got a credential somehow. No, prominent, well respected media members who have never once talked to Leon Rose. Not only have they not talked to Kirk, they have never made eye contact with Leon Rose. I am told that it is so wild over there that there are like, you know, that they just have, a, they, they're, they're known for this year. You remember they don't do press conferences when Jalen Brunson went there? not open to the media to be yeah. discussed. Like apparently the Knicks, you hear those and you think, okay, that's a little crazy. No, that's the tip of the iceberg. They are run completely different than any other organization. So the, they're the Soviet Knicks is what you're describing. <laughs> they kind of are, man. <laughs> like you walk in the hallways and people are, people are, when, if you see Leon Rose, you are to look down. You are not to make eye contact with Leon Rose. That's, that's amazing. I don't. Now, I've know. I've heard it's like even so so much so that there are people on staff that are not even in the front office, like maybe a social media team can't be seen talking to people outside the org. Like you stop them in the hallway, they're like, "Hey, man, I gotta go. I can't do this. Like I'm gonna be spotted talking," and then <laughs> they're gonna start. That's just so me. wild. I mean, I I don't really talk to anybody in the Mavs organization outside of some of their PR people because I just don't want to. But that's crazy to not have the ability to have the access. Because it's like if if in the absence of access, people start to formulate their own like that's how like conspiracy theories happen. Oh my god, <laughs> like, it's so, true. so wild. They don't care. I'm telling you the disparity between the NBA right now. I bring this up from time to time, and I don't know how interested the average fan is, but I bring it up because it's interesting to me. And I think it's one of those things that even if you're not interested now, years from now, the way things are moving, I just want to plant these bugs in people's ears so they see it two mm. years from now when you're like, oh wow. This has really grown. The disparity between what it means to be media in Denver and what it means in Los Angeles and New York is so different. And there's trickle-down effects to how those things affect the way the league is covered, the way the league grows, the way it evolves. And here in Denver, there's nobody here. They beg you to sometimes to cover it, you know, this or that. And as a result, like there's almost a forced openness in certain ways. In certain ways, it's still like ridiculous what's closed off, but a forced like interaction. Then you go to some place like New York where it's like the media is literally not needed. But which one of those two markets do you think is stirring the NBA in the direction it is headed? I mean, for hardcore fans, you'd think it'd be the place where there's access because there's conversation and then there's fun, but it's these the sheer volume of population and differences, particularly for, I guess, New York and California compared to like an Oklahoma city, it's just so different to where they can afford to get away with it. But if, if I, I would want to cater to people who are interested in hopping on a live show in the middle of the day and talking, cause like, that's how you, form, you know, that's where the money is. You, you just talked about it in your, in your, in your pre-show or in you know, your, your kind of intro. And it's so weird that, that these places are, don't want to have the media coverage because you're not avoiding criticism when you I shut know, down the access. It's, so, it's, it's so at true. least at that point you have a little bit, you know, it's, 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 you, you, you have like, like, you know, Mark Cuban once basically called, you know, emailed me out of the blue in a, in an attempt to stifle me from tell, like, right. saying the world that he sucks. And it worked for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> it worked for like a week. Right. So this is a true like, story, by the way. Like, again, even owners are different. But yeah, Mark Cuban actually hit up Kirk Kenderson, gets, hits his contact, and is like, hey, man, why do, invited himself on the show. <sighs> Scared the shit out of me. It's like, what did I do? I'm sorry. 
just writing, writing, writing tweets. Kirk, oh, well. Kirk, man, he, he, you shoot from the hip on, on your, some of your criticism and stuff. Like not, not that they're bad. I'm just saying you're not afraid to I'm be fan. like, you know what? Yeah. This sucks. Yeah. So, um, anyway, it's just an interesting thing with Nick's, um, also Jeremy Grant, I can't remember what podcast Sham Sharani is maybe, or something like that. And he, he, he was on the Nuggets a couple of years back. He left, went to Detroit. And, you know, the report we had heard coming out of Denver was that he was offered the same contract as he was in, in Denver. And I believe that, like, I, you know, I, I never saw the contract, but I still believe it. Like, I believe that was the case. Jeremy Grant presented it, and I think, and I have no reason to disbelieve him either, is that he wanted a certain thing and Denver did not offer it, and so he went to Detroit. We also heard a story that maybe he had other motivations for leaving Denver and these different things. I think all of these things are probably true. But one thing that I do think from now hearing him directly kind of give a story, and actually I, I believe this too just because of some of the things I heard at that time, was that Denver, I think, offered him the deal when they had to, mm -hmm. right? Like when it was, oh, Detroit came through with an offer that exceeded what we expected. Okay, well, we're willing to do that now. And by that point, maybe he was moved on. I think he was probably moved on either way. But it, he did say that they entered into an initial negotiation and it was below what he was requesting and then he got it from Detroit. So, again, I don't know how to, um, you know, I, we'll never know truly, but I do think it's interesting, Kirk. It, I know you're not a Nuggets guy, but it's interesting that they paid a first round draft for this guy, pick for this guy, got him, and then it fell apart potentially because of the money part of it. And, and the order, and and because you, you never know what's going to offend what guy. Because if the Nuggets didn't offer first, did that play into it? Did that insult him? Did that make him feel less worth? You know, there's there's so many factors, and it's so complicated because there's often like layers of communication. Because it's not, you know, the agents are. It, it's it's very difficult to to know where the truth lies in that sort of thing. And. And I remember because we talked about that deal a lot because I was with you and the rest of the DNVR crew the morning that Jeremy Grant got traded to the to the Nuggets. Right. And and that was just a really exciting day. Um, I didn't know who Jeremy Grant was at that time uh, because he was coming from the Nuggets, uh, but not uh, from the Thunder, I think. Right. Yeah. Thunder. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, just that I don't I don't we don't need to dissect this. It was so long ago, but it's one of those things where it's like. It's just a note there that we should have. You probably saw this one, Kirk, though, and I'm going to check it or share screen here if I can. How do I do that? Oh, it's now present. Um, oh, there it is. Share screen. I'm going to share screen here because I want you to see what it is. The most hilarious thing I saw all of yesterday. Did you see this? This is, you know how they do these upside, like a painter comes out and they do a drawing and they're like upside down and then at the end they reveal it. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is the Nuggets one. And let's take a look at Jokic. Oh, the dance. I love this dance. Yeah, do a little dance. Get out of the way. Like, what the? <laughs> Who is this guy? How, yeah, how would you assess he... this uh, this Jokic portrait? I mean, that that looks like a, a like, it, what is that thing? The, the, the Wally? No, the, the, the Dolly thing? Like, that looks like. like yeah, the, oh, you're right. Yeah, the uh, AI. It draws. The, like an AI here. drawing of like, so if someone typed in Jokic melting. Like that's what, it's so weird. Does it I mean, kind of look like Kobe Bryant more it, than Jokic do? I mean, it looks like a like like a mashup of every European bad guy henchman all in one painting. <laughs> like, there's a lot going on here. I just love to like. There's something hilarious about the dance here. The like, all right, nailed it, <laughs> and then like you get out of the way to be like, what? I didn't even see that the first time. <laughs> I'm playing it again, but here it is. The little shake, the little arms up, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Take a look, everyone. Like, um, okay. Wow. I thought it was hilarious. One of those ones. Um, let me see. What else do I have here? <laughs> Man, this one's crazy. Do you remember last year, uh, the numbers with Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert? Not, nobody's passing to, to, to Rudy Gobert, right? Mitchell last year passed to him 4.4 times per game in Utah. This year, Anthony Edwards has passed to Gobert only 1.7 times per game. They've run 125 pick and rolls. Gobert received the ball four times. Four times did Anthony Edwards get the ball to Rudy Gobert this season in pick and roll. Rudy Gobert must, he must low-key be the worst vibes guy because that's two, two ball handlers that are talented in a row that are very quietly like, this guy isn't it through their actions. 
But uh, this is so weird. So I, weird. I feel it's crazy because everybody knows Rudy Gobert is my like le- one of my least favorite guys in all the NBA, and I'm sympathetic to him. I feel bad because there's no one on earth that seems to like Rudy Gobert. Not his None. teammates. There's no like there. Uh, Andy Bailey is a Rudy Gobert stand. That might be it. He might be the only guy in the world that's a Rudy Gobert stand. And there's something to it, like. You know, those two guys broke up and went to different places. I know Cleveland has lost, I think, four in a row or something, so they're on a slide. But they've gotten off to a darling start, and Minnesota looks like they all hate each other. And then you see numbers like this, and you're like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what it is. I'm sympathetic to the people hating the Euros unfairly, but I don't know. There's something to this when you change teams, and it's the exact same story. Yeah. No, it's it, that's really something, and it's the further we we look at this, and I, I think just over the course of the season, they'll figure out a way to write whatever weirdness they have going on. But when you pay that much and basically break the trade market, because I, as a Mavs fan, I'm just livid at that trade still because the Mavericks will like never have that many picks to trade, right. uh, and and it's just it's gonna go down as such. Uh, it's it's just brutal. I and yeah. I, uh, glad I'm my team embarrassing yeah. man and then i love this one um i'm sure you saw this this is a katie <laughs> quote from like two days ago and he says look at our starting lineup edmund sumner royce o'neill joe harris claxton and me it's not disrespect first of all yes this is you called everybody out by their full names it's not disrespect but what are you expecting from that group you expect us to win because i'm out there this is the craziest we're in the craziest timeline kirk is this not like I know there's some people are like, well, he's just saying the truth, this or that. Yeah, but he's saying it. So my favorite part about this is is this gets into the weeds of like reporting. LeBron James and Dame Lillard, because they went through Chris Haynes, right? That this is a Chris Haynes story where this quote came from. Katie just goes and says it. LeBron and Dame basically pull the sources thing, but it's straight out of their mouths. Like right, there's, right, the, right. there's just the veneer of sourcing. And of so there's elements of this where really like as a colleague and, and someone who works hard, something like this always really makes me laugh hard because he's basically saying all his coworkers stink. As <laughs> all like, of them. <laughs> all of them down to the wire. And and then there was like some weird complaints about how he didn't feel like that they were practicing appropriately. It's like you're a 34 year old player. Like, what you guys don't need to practice. You need to look well, at what's on. I mean, maybe some of these guys. I don't know. Do I don't know. I don't know about that last part. All I'll say is that it's funny because there's more to the quote that I think is even more re- revealing, where he's talking about like it's not. He's basically saying, "Am I my brother's keeper? Is yeah. it my fault that this guy can't do this thing? Is it my fault?" And part of me wants to go, "Yes." Like heavy is the head that wears the crown. Like your response. I mean, we talk about this with Jokic all the time. He's great. His individual greatness is like unassailable, but the next level is how do you get the most out of your peers? Like what roles do you take on all these different things? KD seems to want no part of that. And the thing that drives me most nuts about him is he was on a warriors team and he kind of pulled the same thing. All that stuff Steph does is cute, but you need me come Mm -hmm. the conference finals. And it's like, KD man to me is he's such an enigma. I just, I don't know what to make of him um, because he's such a great player, but quotes like that just tell me he doesn't get it. For every interesting thing he says, for every bit of like very funny or very on the nose commentary about whatever, he seems to have something like that too, which will pull back any goodwill he has established. And then the, the thing with these guys that have these 14, 15 year track records by now is there's just such a, like we have access to all the receipts at once and you can be like, okay, <laughs> this guy is, he kind of sucks when you like boil it all together. I know we know so like every athlete we would have hated if we had like an infinite amount of time, which the internet provides, right? There's millions of people on it and everybody just like looks up old archives. But if like everything Kareem had ever said, we'd always be coming back and like, look on Thursday, 1976, he said this thing and it's, it's <laughs> dumb. <laughs> He, he said Magic Johnson wasn't any good. Like, there'd be something there. All right, this is my last fun one I have, and then we can get into some Mavs nugget stuff. Um, and this is actually a couple days still. This is the oldest thing, but I love Scotty Barnes. Are you a Scotty Barnes guy? He is talented, man. I would love to have him on my team. He's my kind of player, but what he's a little bagless, though. All right, you get an ISO. Look at this. This is the funniest cooking I've ever seen in my life. There's no cooking. <laughs> There's this is no a- cook- and this is, I mean, he keeps going into it like he's about to. 
I'm about to. All right. <laughs> There's nothing. It's the worst move I've ever seen. It so, cracks me so, up so much. I, I have a six-year-old son, and he's, like, learning sports. And when they try to teach some of these things, when you watch it from, from like, our level after being involved with basketball our whole lives, you really take for granted some of the things that you do instinctually. Right. And – the crossover dribble is one of the funnier things that I cannot get my boy to figure out. He's like, well, I'm switching hands. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, let's watch this video. Let's do this. And like, that's what that reminded me of. Cause he's just, he's dribbling real hard, like going real hard, but not going anywhere. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. It's a terrible one. All right. Let's get into some nuggets stuff here. Um, why was Luca out? My first question is, is there any chance there's mysterious misses to games and then they lead to COVID protocols? Is that what's going on here with Luca? Why was he out last night? Oh, they had played him 41 minutes the night before, and Kid basically they they really are concerned about his minutes totals for whatever reason, even though he's 23. And yeah. he started to look a little haggard. Um, if yeah. you watch the Luca quarter by quarter stats, he just gets like he goes first, second, third. He's like that horse meme where like by the end of the that's yeah. him in the yeah. fourth. He's really bad. So they just they thought they could get away with it and they sat him against the Rockets and then the Mavericks um the Mavericks lost in a horribly embarrassing fashion to the Rockets. It was neat. It is funny though, man. I mean Denver lost to the Knicks on the second night of a back to back. Like that at Utah at Denver back to back. The NBA's kind of gotten rid of it. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this last night. I think they've overcorrected with Denver because that really was the league's most unfair back-to-back -back when you had to go from Utah to Denver, two games at altitude back-to-back -back with travel. That one's tough. But when you completely eliminate it, like all back-to-backs are tough. So yeah. going from you have the toughest one to now you never get that one is like, all right, well, now you're at a bit of a disadvantage. Nonetheless, sure. the, Knicks, the Knicks had it last night, caught Denver at a moment in time when they didn't have Nicola, didn't have Aaron Gordon. Um, had Bones Highland coming back from COVID, and they ended up sneaking one out. Denver should have won it. They ended up sneaking out the win here. Um, but those are two bad losses to Houston and to the Knicks on a second night of a road back-to-back. -back. Those are two bad ones. So my question is, who's worse? Denver without Jokic, Dallas without Luka? Dallas without Luka. Dallas easily. without Luka. No question. Easily, yeah, because um... – uh, it's it was so it the the five Dallas starters not a single one scored in double digits the starting lineup scored twenty seven total points we're it gonna have was, a little cook off we have, we're gonna have a cook off here though Denver's starters did not score in the fourth quarter <laughs> <laughs> in a game they were trying to win Z okay. <laughs> they were trying to win they had zero point not zero field goal zero points. That's pretty tough. That's a good counter. I like and, that. One. And they were playing against the Knicks team on the second night of a back to back. By all intents, you know, they should have been mm. tired at that moment. Yeah. Oh man. That's that's a good counter. I like that one. I I I think that it's like it's it's differentiating levels of pain where it's like <laughs> one was just embarrassing throughout. Whereas right. when you look at that in the fourth quarter, it's like, oh no, this just happened. I think it's I think you're right though that it is Dallas. I think Denver kind of you know it, it's a little bit of a last minute thing who's in who's out denver didn't really have a chance to prepare anything i know dallas probably didn't either but i think that it was a little bit more of an anomaly and you do have jamal coming back from injury and these different things but i would agree but there's something too both of these teams are so predicated on playing a specific system that's designed for a, a lead player that when you take that out you know michael malone he was so like sarcastic yesterday in his pregame and postgame commentary and i hate it it's like why be sarcastic? Somebody asked, do you run the same stuff now that Nicole is out or do you adjust and call different plays? And he's like, if Nicole is not there, of course we call different plays. But it's a legitimate question. Most of what you do is based around a player. Yeah. Like how much can you actually put in in one day, one practice? I would think that it actually implies you're going to run most of the same stuff. Um, but nonetheless, both teams, you take out the lead piece and it's like, what is your identity? Mm-hmm. And and with the Mavericks, what they they have found out very quickly, particularly with Jalen Brunson, who's obviously now with the Knicks, is the the Mavericks don't have anything. Um, Spencer Spen didn't Spencer didn't when he go off. Spencer didn't when he goes off with Luca last night. He shot three of eighteen without Luca, so that oh, will give he, you pulled, a, he pulled a quarter. Mm, and it was it's it's one of these very difficult things to where the Mavericks do not have an offense. It's not that they. Right. They they run simplistic sets or something like that. They have no offense. And if if you go watch, I do not recommend watching this game. It's bad for your health, uh, even if you're just a basketball fan. Period. But they <laughs> they just run constant ISOs, 
and yeah. really lethargic pick and rolls. And you know, this this I, I know always chaps you. Nobody in the NBA knows how to set a screen, and then very few guards are willing to use a screen properly mm-hmm. in terms of like actually running somebody off it. So the Mavericks were just basically doing different post ups and different pick and rolls, and it was awful. Whereas with Luca, they they tend to run the same stuff. Only Luca is an offense unto himself, the way Jokic is, and Luca on you know runs these little rub screens that are basically for the purposes of getting a mismatch, and then he posts somebody yeah. up and isolates them. It's yep. kind of ugly basketball, but it works. Yep. Yeah. So, I I blame your guy Bob Volgaris for this, by the way, who went obviously worked for Dallas for a short period of time. But the thing about it is, is we're perfecting the game, meaning we're learning more and more about statistically what works and how to maximize yeah. value in this or that. And ugly basketball kind of works. If you have a Luca, it works to not pass, never pass it. Just let him mm-hmm. have it, make one pass per possession. It's the scoring pass and grind the clock out, hunt the switch, slow it down. So to your point, I don't know that it's wrong. Like you're talking about it as ugly. There might be something too. Luca's game, though it may be skilled and beautiful in moments, the best way to get to it might be to play ugly for a majority of it and then have these moments of brilliance. Well, it's it's interesting. I was listening to Zach Lowe and Tim McMahon on Lowe's podcast earlier this week, and Lowe described before Brooklyn fell to pieces, before Harden hurt his hamstring, what James Harden did within the, the Knicks, or I'm sorry, the Nets offense was orchestrate and be a point guard for quarters one through three. And then in the fourth quarter, they used they used Harden as the uh, as the hammer, as the right. finisher, the isolation hunter. That you cannot stop this offense, right? And that is what I wish Dallas would go towards. Unfortunately, and this will be really apparent when when uh, the the Nuggets and Mavericks play each other. Dallas has approx. They have one other regular rotation player who can dribble. I'm not talking playmake. I mean dribble. It is wildly uncomfortable, and that's just Spencer Dinwiddie, and right. and it just it gets dark in a hurry for for Dallas if things aren't cooking. Like they have pretty good standstill shooters, catch and shoot guys, but if they aren't hitting, all of a sudden it becomes just a like three yards in a cloud of dust offense. It's terrible. Forget the Luca part of this because I'm going to ask a question and the answer is Luca. All right, let's go to answer number B. How is Dallas going to beat Denver? Like, what is the other thing that they're going to do that's going to beat Denver? I mean, it's the answer is what we kind of mentioned earlier is Spencer Dinwiddie, who he's playing in this off ball role prior to last night where he was one of nine for three prior to last night. You're shooting something like 45 percent from three. I saw that. Yeah, he was one of the there's like six guys in the NBA that were over 45 percent on five plus a game. Michael Porter he's shooting like eight. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. That's and, crazy. And, 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 you know, Porter is such a, like, like a beautiful shot taker. Right. Like his form is perfect. Spencer's more like, he does some interesting catch and shoot stuff, but because the catch and shoot stuff is going down, it's giving him the confidence on like Jason Terry, 2011 pull-ups that yeah. just you know make me go, no, no, no. Yes. Every time one goes in. So that's, that's kind of the main way that I see this happening is like Luca and Dinwiddie combining for, you know, 55 to 60 points together i mean there's a good chance that's going to happen and we're going to talk about one of the reasons why um here on the other side of this one but so i and i i forgot about that there's like seven players that are shooting that crazy volume three right now and i don't know why i mean my only theory do you have a theory my only theory is that 10 years ago steph curry taught the world that shooting ridiculous shots is actually not ridiculous if you practice them and Mm -hmm. have the skill to do it and now all these guys are nobody's like steph even Steph is getting better, by the way. Steph's a better shooter right now than I think he's ever been, which it's is a crazy story. thing to think. But all these guys have just gotten better and better, and we're learning that the ability to do this is actually in some people. We thought it was in one guy. It's actually in some people, and I, I don't know. Part of me just thinks it's not an anomaly that all these guys are shooting hot. It's it's very strange because if we go back to the bubble, we saw all kinds of outlandish shooting from from like Anthony Davis is the greatest example as you guys yeah. ran into. Of course. But you know, in, in a gym filled with people, it's even kind of wilder. Uh and and when the mat when when team basketball started last year, the 2021-22 season, I I had multiple discussions with people where is it the because Mavericks were not hitting shots. I don't remember what other teams were doing, but the Mavericks were terrible. We had like actual discussions about is it the new ball? Is the ball the problem? Right, right, like right. You know, it just you know, it turned out guys were not hitting because that that stuff happens. 
But I don't know how to like like Spencer Dinwiddie is such an interesting guy because in Brooklyn, well, his whole career prior to Dallas, he shot thirty one point eight percent from three. He is shooting fourteen percent higher. At least he was the other day. And I don't know what to that make of it make because sense. it's not a small sample. It's like fifty right. plus games it, it, and a lot of volume, like two hundred something threes. I don't know. It's, it's there's not a story hard. there about like some little d- tweak he made or something. I mean, usually there's got to be something. You're right. It's James such an outlier. Herbert, James Herbert of CBS Sports told me that it's the kind of shots he's taking now, which are much more. There's no there's yep. no step backs. There's some side step threes, but he's just actually just kind of catching and shooting like you wouldn't practice. Like the, right. the very little movement. And that's made a big difference because they're not necessarily like end of shot clock heave tile style shots, which apparently was a, a forte or like a normal thing for him in Brooklyn. That that to me is what it is with Michael Porter. Um, he is, you know, he's a guy that is a natural forty three percent three point shooter. He's at forty nine percent because he's like because he's cut out like you know mm-hmm. two shots a game that were bad, and right. you just do that, and all of a sudden you're really good. So. Maybe that's part of it too, like the increased ability, but also the increased understanding of where shots should come from and should not. Maybe it's funny, but players talked about, you know, analytics. I don't want to be looking at spreadsheets while I'm playing basketball. And of course you don't, but maybe players really are internalizing where the highest volume shots come from and eliminating the ones that aren't there. I'm remembering something from way back when Chris Bosch was in Toronto, where he was a guy who was very open to analytics early on. See, I mean, guy like programs his own computers, really smart, right. interesting right. guy. And they had shown him that like all his points were coming from certain areas. And he was just like, okay, that's all. That's the only place I'm going to shoot from then. Right. <laughs> and it's like, sometimes it really is that simple. Yeah. I think there, I think it might be in this, in this instance, it might be something that's like that, at least for Michael Porter, I really think it is. And I'm curious after that, I mean, Michael Porter, you talked about the three, what was it? Three for 18 or something from Spencer Dinwiddie. I think Michael Porter was like two for 11 or something last night. I mean, he had a rough night himself. You watch these technically sound guys and like Porter definitely fits that bill. His, he is just so technically sound to where when you, when you work out the kinks where you show him the few areas of like, this is not the good shot for you. That is that that does make sense that it translates to a percentage leap. Right. Um, guys, Pins and Aces is the official golf apparel partner of DMVR. We got great gear, you know, sent to us here. I know my guy Spencer, uh, who is our golf pro at DNVR, he's only wearing pins and aces gear. I'm not kidding. Every single day, snow, he's got a pins and aces like snow thing. Short weather, he's got pins and aces shorts. Everything he wears is pins and aces. They're family-owned golf and apparel business right here in Colorado. You guys know how much I love the local thing. And they make amazing polos, hats, golf bags. Uh, who's the guy, Kirk? The John? Is it John Daly? The the golfer that's like kind of a... a oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Daly, right? It's John Daly. Yeah. Pins and aces, they almost make like golf clothing that he wears you know what i mean like it's like it's wild and out there and kind of hilarious they also make these uh golf bags that are incredible because they store seven beers right inside your golf bag and keep it cold during the entire round now when i say that it sounds like a bag right kirk that you would slide cans of beer in right this thing is like a giant stick with a little tap on the top so while you're out there you just like drink right from the tap of this sure. giant things that hold seven beers it's a mobile incredible. kegerator it's like a little mini mobile kegerator that goes in your golf bag. It's actually the coolest thing ever. I thought it was the most amazing thing. So check out pinsandaces.com. You'll be the, the talk of the golf club. Uh, use code DMVR to receive 15% off your first order and get free shipping. Again, that's pinsandaces.com. Also want to tell you about Eric's favorite sponsor, Athletic Greens. You know, Eric went to Serbia recently. And when he came back, the number one thing I noticed his fingernails, incredible fingernails. They were so refined thanks to the 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that help you start your day right. They come in a little packet if you get the mobile one or if you get the, the bottle, it comes with a little scoop. One scoop inside of the bottle that they give you. So you know, no question about am I measuring everything right? I throw a little ice in there to make it cold, stir it around, chug it, and there you go. You've got all of the different vitamins and different things that you need for the day. Gives you a little energy boost, optimized immune system, all those different things. Uh, And it's really, really great. So check them out. Um, Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's actually true. Knock on wood. I have not 
I have not run the, the sickness bug. Everybody in the company has been getting that one. I have not so far, although my kids did. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills, supplements uh, to look out for your health. Go ahead and visit athleticgreens.com slash nuggets. Don't forget that nuggets part, athleticgreens.com slash nuggets. All right, we're back here with Kirk Henderson. We're talking nuggets. We're talking Dallas. Um, what worries you about Denver tomorrow? Without Jokic, what worries you? If Luke is playing, no. Yeah. Hey, you you feel like if Luke is playing, that's a that's a win. Um, he's he's the he's been the terminator. I I have been to three games and uh, two games, and he scores with such effortlessness that the the only thing that can harm them is their coaching and and their the back end of their bench. Um he he is as he he's as close to I think I might see him him being on an MVP mission. I'm not sure how much it matters to him, but he he is just crushing with the kind of of force that I've not seen him play with ever. Um what what what's leveled up about him? You think he's just like older, stronger, better? A little bit. I I he came into camp from uh the from Eurobasket in nice shape. Right. Uh, he really started to figure it out last year around January and he doesn't love getting hammered, but there's, there's something about his willingness to keep going to the cup right now. That's been very, very helpful. He's, he doesn't have like Jason Tatum style numbers in the paint, but he's just so skilled at getting a shot whenever he needs it. Right. It's like a blend of Kobe and Dirk. It's really something watching him play right now because his ball handling is exquisite. He's stronger than everyone. That's like the under the the yeah. kind of undervalued thing. Watching defenders just bounce off him, even bigger defenders. It's really it's it's kind of shocking. Uh, and and once he decides to put his head down, he's he's going to score. The thing right. that beats him down is like what I mentioned earlier, to where he's been a big first half guy, and then in the second half he loses focus, and then he's also tired, and then things kind of get out of whack. Right. Yeah. The, the the wear down, I guess, is a part of this. The thing that's weird, and this is my biggest complaint. Here's where I'm going to go full whiny voice. I hate this thing that the NBA is doing, where they play two times in a row in the same city. You don't like Not that. What's that? You don't like that. Interesting. I hate it. I hate it. Now, it's good for like travel purposes, right? Okay, we're going to try to cut down on travel. I get that. But here's the thing about an 82-game season. This happened to Denver last year. Mm. Denver has an injury right now, or a COVID, with Jokic. And Aaron Gordon has an illness. I don't know how you have an illness. Everybody on the team has COVID. <laughs> but Gordon only has an illness. We'll, we'll see how. I don't know. A little skeptical. They brought in Aaron Gordon to guard Luka Doncic, that was the number one guy they said, like, hey, he's a rare he example a of a guy job. that has the size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has the size to do it. Both of those guys are out. When you play a team twice in one week, you're so much more vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. And it happened to Denver last year. They had a double header against some team at the exact moment when they were missing key guys. And it's like, Denver, Dallas, those are important matchups. Yeah. Like, this is four playoff seating on two teams that are in the same tier. So, or at least that, close. And these are almost certainly two losses for Denver. That well, you say that, ah, uh, and then the Mavericks are are capable of anything. I'll tell you that much. But I, I that actually is is a pretty good counter argument. I really like the paper theory because when it number one, it's hard to beat any team two times in a row. Back to like, yeah, and, and yeah, that's yeah. what one of the elements that I love about it. The second thing that I love is that it engenders a little bit of hostility. Um, <laughs> sure, yeah, like there's no real rivalries anymore. And when these guys play each other, they just you know it's like back in the day when like the 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 uh, Celtics and Sixers had to play each other 13 times by the end of the season, everybody's sick of one another. And you see, you get that a little bit in these home and home series. The one, the, the part that, that is also worth mentioning, I think that, you know, that you didn't address is even if you don't, even if like both teams are healthy, they play each other. Now, the simple fact is if you play all four of your games, like in these, in these Western conference matchups, the three to four games that you play a team, if you do that in the first 40 games of the season, by the end of the season, these teams are usually completely different. You divide, right. you divide it up into quartiles right. and like, yeah. you don't really know anything. You don't really learn much about the matchup. I mean, the but Suns I like that though, I, that's what I like is you play at different points. Cause you can mm -hmm. almost go back and say, okay, they beat them early. In the middle of the year, this guy was starting to come on. In the end of the year, they were put together and they steamrolled. Yeah. So I kind of like getting a little sample from different ones. You do make some good points, though, about 
I haven't noticed it. Like Denver just played San Antonio twice in a row. I don't notice a rivalry that brewed up there. No. I don't but know. It's that possible. Here. Like if something salty happens in third quarter, like Spencer Denwood, he runs his mouth to Jamal Murray and they get into a little bit of a shoving match. Like maybe we could lean all the way into this then, Kurt. Could you just do like Denver plays Dallas three times a year? Could they just play them all in a row and then they move on to an like baseball little series? Yeah, like, baseball right. series. See, like yeah. I there's I secretly love the concept just for that element of it because we've complained for years that these guys are too friendly. And yeah. you gotta you you get like there'll be a love there'll be a a a love fest between Luca and Jokic before the game there'll be all these photos and we'll all be happy about it well, and all of us all of us fans who like both these players will envision both of them playing together and it's like no no i want blood i want anger i want these guys to it's you know it's sports it's competition it's 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 i i need that sort of stuff i love it all right i want to get to this part here now we got to move on because i want to talk about building around Jokic and luka and here's sure. my theory cuz you're complaining a lot i see you on twitter you're complaining a lot about a lack of talent, you know, they're, they're in Dallas. And I think if you look at it, there is a lack of talent. There's not a lot of like, there's no second star. There's no mm -hmm. player that you're like, oh, that's the second guy. The thing I think though, is what we've learned from LeBron's championships and, and from some of these guys, when you're a LeBron level player, and I think that Luka and Jokic are both this, I don't mean in, like LeBron's the best of this mold, but I just mean that they are the type of player that can carry a team. Mm -hmm. Some superstars can't. Some superstars are really good players, but they're not necessarily carry a team because they don't do everything the way a Luka or a Jokic does. It doesn't make them better or worse. But Jokic does 90% of what you need to set the table on offense and scores and does all this. Luka's the exact same way. I actually think that fit is going to be as important, if, if anything. Defense is going to be important and obviously the system. And my here's my take. I think Kyrie got really massively overrated playing next to LeBron James because it mm -hmm. felt like, oh, he's a great sidekick to LeBron. Like he does, he was a great one-on-one -on -one scorer. He was a glorified. This is going to sound. I'm going to get clipped for this, and then it's going to go viral, and it's going to be the worst thing ever. In some ways, in some ways, he was a glorified Jalen Brunson. What I mean by that is, LeBron did all of the stuff Luca does, sets the table, this or that, and then they had a release valve that was a great one-on-one -on -one player. So if you're LeBron and you create a half step advantage but you don't create something off of that kick to Kyrie scramble defense or you created a switch and now he isos and he just feasts at that Jalen Brunson I think did the same thing catches on the move gets into the paint scores I I think that's actually more I don't know that Luke is going to win a championship with a superstar number two I think he might actually win a championship with the right pieces none of whom are really close to being a superstar I'm I'm just not sure I'm just not sure because there's been some criticism in the chat. I've noticed there's there's this sort of thing goes around the league with how Luca plays right now. Can you win with this? Well, they got to the Western Conference Finals. So did James Harden playing this way on a right. arguably very crappy uh, Rockets team, and they still won 65 games. So I'm not sure. And one of the things that I'm really not sure about is whether Luca wants to play this way. This is a constant back and forth. And I think the answer is he does. He does. Come on, uh, man. <laughs> but I think that that there needs to be more open discussion and criticism of him of what do you do if you do play more collaborative team-based ball? Because you'll watch him these next two games, guys. Just watch. Starting around the second quarter, they'll move him off ball. He's going to go stand on the right wing or the left corner, and he'll put his hands on his knees, and he won't move. And I lose my mind. Yeah. One of the big, like, like the thing that, that makes basketball, like, that makes Denver so fun to watch is the way the ball starts popping when things are moving around. And if you get Luka as a screener or do any of these things differently, what happens? And the answer is we don't really know because we've not seen enough of it because we want to play his way. I, I think that that you're 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 probably right as a, I'm talking and thinking at the same time that the collaborative pieces around him are going to have to be, you know, the, it's going to have to be kind of the right fit of guys. But unfortunately, what the Mavericks have done, and you've seen me complain, they, you know, to go back in time, guys, the Mavericks gave up a pick to get Luca and two picks to get Chris Stapps Porzingis. Every single move that they've made in the off seasons from 2018 yeah. on has not worked. Right. They've, they've only gotten this far because Luca is very good. So I still don't know what this means to what the Mavericks future could be because the Mavericks are surrounded by just such okay guys. I mean, I, 
you know, not to like the, the thought experiment of what would happen is if you put some of the Denver role players around Luca is very interesting to me because I, I, I wonder if they'd be really good. <laughs> I don't know. I well, so this is what's interesting though, because Denver has a team right now that's built around Jamal Murray and uh Michael Porter Jr. And I think Jamal Murray, like I, I want to be fair to him. I want to give him time to get back. This is not a critique. Mm-hmm. I think he's been very good, you know, so far. But I still think that he is likely the likeliest outcome for him is like right there, sub all star. Maybe yeah. he's really good, but he's not one of the four best guards in the in in the conference or what have you. But he's really good. That's not a knock on him. There's great guards like Steph Curry and Dame Lillard and Luka Doncic. Like there's guys that are that I think are just a little bit above him that are that are great. But it doesn't matter because he's a perfect fit, an A plus fit with Nikola. He does everything there. But then you have Michael Porter, and I just look at it and I go. Does Denver just need all of these things? When Michael Porter's hitting, Denver wins by a ton. Yeah. But I just wonder if it's like when you talk about the teams that have won, you know, even Kevin Love had to segue into a lesser role than what he was capable of and maybe even a lesser player who is just good at those things that he was doing for them. That might be the system. And I kind of think the answer is yes. Like LeBron James's Cavs teams were good. They were not great. Mm-hmm. They had a great guy in Kyrie that could take advantage of the things they needed him to hit the big shot. And he was tailor made to do those things. He had LeBron and then he just had a bunch of guys that could defend that were smart and knew where to be. And I think for both Luca and Nicola, the teams probably are going to look more like that or, or should look more like that where those guys are maybe the names are going to be less impressive, but it's misleading. It's actually exactly what they need. Yeah. I mean, role is very important, but being to use kind of a football term, I think the NBA needs players who are more multiple and there's just a lot of guys and you get, and this just happens, even though the NBA is extremely talented, you, you get to the, the sixth, seventh, eighth guys who lack like a, a, an extremely important basketball skill in one way or another. And I, I think what Luca needs around him is guys who may not necessarily need the ball, but are more complete players than what they have. And yeah. that and that's just hard to do. Building teams is really difficult. The suit I, I think we constantly underrate the chasm between superstars and next tier guys. So like, true. Like, I strongly agree with this. Strongly agree. So, I mean, like uh, yeah, Luca is great, and then you have players like Andrew Wiggins, who was an all-star last mm-hmm. year. And it's like those are that's not a comparison. There's there's an enormous gap there. And but once was, guys hit that like superstar tier, it becomes a little bit dicey. Like I saw someone in the chat earlier saying. The, the Nuggets should trade for uh, Shea, Shea Gillius Alexander. That dude is a superstar to me. Like, I think he yeah. is next level. Now, I could be overrating him at the moment, but once you know, it, it's once you get a guy like that, you never really get proper value in return should you decide to move on from him. And that's just that's a difficult position to be in. Yeah, you're right about Shea's really, really good. He's just in such a weird system. I have a hard time evaluating him. Like mm-hmm. everything, they play a brand of basketball that's different than everyone else. Um, yeah. And it, I mean, they're trying for it to not work, so it's a little weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Warriors are a bit of an example of this in that some of the guys that they brought in that they won with, I mean, obviously Steph is a superstar, Draymond's a superstar, and Clay Thompson at moments was a superstar, although he was not last year. He was not a right. superstar last year. But they did end up having the right blend of guys around him that just made the perfect sense. And I think there's going to be something, again, true of Denver with that. And again, it's not just the talent. Like, do they have defense? Sometimes it's toughness and hustle and physicality and bring it and and those types of things. And then I think the 76ers, the Nets are a counterexample of this, right? The Nets are the ultimate. They got all these star players. None of them fit. and They're terrible. Like, the Nets are the ultimate failure experiment, you know. Kyrie, KD, Ben Simmons, or Harden, that's three elite players, and they suck. They absolutely suck together. Yeah. Um, and then I think the 76ers are the biggest counterexample of this in the wrong direction in that really we should actually not say the 76ers. We should say the Houston Rockets. Maybe this is just survivorship bias. Like they lost, so we write them off and say it was the wrong way when really it was just luck. But they did everything to tailor to their star so that he, but instead of it tailoring so that they could win i felt like they were tailoring it so that their star could look the best that he could and i think those two things are different yeah no that makes sense is that fair yeah um draymond somebody says draymond superstar stop it adam he's one of the, like the 10 best defenders of the modern nba era from 1984 forward so i mean He's you're right that he's not like a superstar from like marketing, but from defense, there's not five players that had a bigger impact defensively than him. In fact, here's my point, Kirk. The Warriors won because of defense, not offense. 
it was primarily the defense that got them going here. Um, all right. Do you have time for one quick little little aside here? I think I can. <laughs> the, the quick aside is two weeks ago, you flamed Locked On Warriors. Ooh. You flamed them because they had this thing about, hey, we are the credentialed media. Ergo, you should respect us more than other people, right? You had this right. thing. I see the Twitter blue thing, which has all been a big deal lately, and I'm kind of intrigued by the concept. There's a lot. Of, I don't want to get into the politics of it. I don't want to get into any of that. I just want to talk about this idea of people are like upset that certain members of the media are going to have their blue check marks stripped away and other people have had it. Part of me looks at this and I go, as somebody who did not grow up in the system, I look at this and I go, I, I, I kind of hate that Twitter decides who is a, and this is just sports, who is a respected sports journalist and who is not. Half the people at DMVR don't have blue checks for some reason, and right. I don't know why. And then some people do have them, and I'm just like, that Twitter is deciding that DNVR doesn't get to have the same cloud as other people. And I don't like it. It's the same argument that I would have that you made basically for these Warriors guys of like, what makes you think you're special and that your takes are more respected just because you're granted a, an arbitrary access? 100%. 100%. One of the things I, I, I will tell, like when I, I think of myself as a fan. I'm an analyst, but I'm a fan first. I'm not going to lose my fandom in some bullshit notion of being arbitrary. It's not something I'm interested in. I am I am an expert in the sense of I watch a lot of hoops, but I am not like a trained basketball expert that has some degree. My blue check mark is ultimately meaningless, and if they strip it from me, I'm just fine with that. I was fine with it before. I'll be fine with it after. And the notion of democratization of content and democratization of opinions matters. And if you are worth listening to, people will listen to you. That is kind of exactly. what it comes down to. That's exactly what it is. And I just, so part of me, like, we'll see how it all shakes out. Nobody really knows. I just love when everyone jumps to a conclusion because two weeks ago, we were all making fun of the fake status yeah. among sports media. And now we're like clamoring for them to re be given this, the, the, an arbitrary. I hate it. Look I, at it. And I'm just like, why? I don't understand it. I, I hate it. It's, 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 it's a, it's complaining to complain. And it's, it's, you know, sports stuff in particular, where it's like, this is not, you know, we're, we're not passing along nuclear codes that we get. Everyone needs to relax. Yeah. All right. Real quick. So prediction, what is Dallas? Do they win both of them? One of them? What happens here? this? Weekend? I think, I think it's a split just because I think beating teams is particularly difficult. I think that, that this might be, if Murray has been having a little bit of a tough time, I think this might be a delightful get right game for him. Cause Dallas can't guard a chair these days. Um, we didn't even address it, but their key off season acquisition was JaVale McGee. And he's already been sent to the, uh, to, to he's 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 hurt with a neck strain he good he strain? can't play no. yeah neck strain don't know how, how you do did, do we need to get him a new pillow i'm not sure um it's it's the the mavericks can't shoot right now the, this could be really like luca will be fun to watch but the the rest of it is going to be a riot um the, the the one guy that i'll be entertained to get your opinion on is their third year forward josh green who is a lightning rod for mavericks fans primarily because he is was selected in the midst of a bunch of other guys who are actually really really right, good right and yeah. he's not bad he's just young and he's not particularly skilled at any one thing so his progress path has been difficult and we're all everyone kind of needs him to be better and he just he's just he just he's, he's a guy who's like a second contract guy when he's like 28 i think he's going to be really good because he's really athletic and strong and big and how he plays against denver if he gets 20 minutes that'll be fun that's the sort of thing i'm, I'm looking for this is going to be a good matchup i like both these both these teams yeah, I don't think it'll be a good matchup, sadly. I think Denver's in a little bit of a tight spot right now. And um, Sure. Well, we, we get two of the most stubborn head coaches in the league, and Mike Malone and Jason Kidd, who just passively, aggressively throw barbs in the media at things that are their fault. Uh, yeah. Kidd's much worse about this, but like my, my favorite Malone thing is like, what do you mean I should play differently? I should do something <laughs> different in this economy. Like I, like I need that to be a Malone. And then there's Jason Kidd who, and I want you guys to watch this. He has his hands in his pockets all the time. And it makes me crazy because it looks like he's just like, he's the fan with the best seat in the house. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm, I'm, I just, well, this is a great basketball game. Love being here. That kind of stuff. Anyhow. All right. That does it for us today, guys. Kept you a little bit long. Kirk, thanks so much for hopping on. Uh, Mavs money ball. What's the name of the pod? Uh, same Mavs Money Ball podcast. Mavs Money Ball podcast. Check those things out if you want to hear. If Denver wins, then you can go listen to him complain about it. It's always fun. My favorite thing to do. Thanks for having me. Talk soon, okay? Later, everybody.